All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to yet another episode of the Pigeonhole Motorcycle Podcast. I am lucky tonight um, from the Holiday Inn Express. He, he's not a millionaire, but he did stay at a Holiday Inn Express. Uh, Mr. Chris Zenner from Zoos E-Bikes. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. Hey, buddy. It's great to see you again. I know, I know. It's been too long, like, what, four uh, days? It's been at least four days, and I've, every minute I mark on my, my calendar. So since, so, that time, since that time in the stall at the Cowboy Shirt Store. Yeah, so a lot of people don't know the story, but so I was at a, uh, you know, because I wear my cowboy hat and stuff. I was at the Cowboy Shirt Store and stuff, and uh, I was trying on a new, you know, Wrangler shirt, and uh, I heard some, uh, you know, some noise next to me. and uh, Some rustling. He was rustling, <laughs> so I had to say, rustling or wrestling. Not sure which one. Wrestling, wrestling around. I said, "Howdy, sir. Um, you having problems over there?" And you're like, hey. "Chris is like, hey, do these uh, assless chaps make me look fat?" And I'm like, "Oh hell no!" So we started talking, and we were kind of BFFs from there. Or at least that's how we sat and we met in our dreams. Right, right. Actually, I, I think <laughs> that the was the time... ideal scenario of how we hung out. <laughs> right. When is the first time we hung out? Was it handbuilt in Austin? Yeah, that or the one show last year. Uh, no, no, it I would. It would. One show. You know, I discovered Craig the same way everybody else did through his huh. ridiculous Instagram <laughs> videos, and uh, it was actually kind of early on because you know I've got my ear to the ground on Instagram like everybody else, or even before that uh, on the forums and whatnot. So, like, it didn't take long for anybody, one person, two person to share. And you're like, okay, what's going on over here? See what's going on. But it was really at the beginning. And uh, I, I, it was clear to me, at least, that somebody is, like, holding the camera, especially when, like, successive video is coming out. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, there, there's some production value here. And then it wasn't, um, wasn't great production value. <laughs> I, I didn't say what the value was. I'm just right. saying that there, there was, was value. Production, some value. It could have been negative. <laughs> <laughs> who knows but then you know you and that so like that was leading up to that hand-built show when he brought the dustbin and um then you showed up as his girlfriend and i was like oh, i'd like to introduce myself to him to I, her. I prefer and, plus one i'm, a, I'm yeah. plus one. All right. we were both definitely it was it was definitely at that first uh party with the pool and i i saw you taking a look at the drink and you were gonna go in but you didn't <laughs> unfortunately i did i was i wanted to go in but then uh I forget what's her name, Lucy. I I love that rooftop. In fact, you know they switched uh, it to that castle thing last year, and that was rad. I mean, it's a castle on a hill, but I don't know something about a lit up pool at night on a rooftop turns me yeah. on. No, I I totally understand. And then uh, we got together um, at uh, Mike's place in uh, Chicago. Uh, I think it was his yeah yeah screening the oil in the blood after party. No, I wasn't Maybe? there for that. I was traveling for work. It was another party because we talked about shooting videos for your for your project that was coming up. I've been yeah. there twice, I think. We always run fed, into each other in the strangest of places, you know. Yeah. Well, people are, stores people and all. probably don't want to hear our bullshit anyway. So No, okay. you're right. So let's get on with it. Yes, let's get let's get on. Uh, Dave edit, edit edit all that out there. Bullshit. Okay. So um let's talk about um so if anybody doesn't know, um Chris uh has a company called Zoos. Am I saying it yeah. correctly now? Zoos, Zoos bikes. You said however you want. Z O O Z. Um, bikes. Yeah. So I'm I'm doing that thing. I'm one of the couple, like half a handful of guys behind that. Um, it started as a actually a necessity. I had moved to Chicago, and I got my own little workshop, which is a glorified shed with a roll-up garage door. I guess it's a garage, but. It's a, a weak display of one, but great for my uses. And um, I quickly found out, I'm sure we'll rewind throughout here, but you know, sure. fast forward to me moving to Chicago. I met a lovely lady during another one of my projects, moved to Chicago uh, against my better intuition, but it all ended up working out. Anyway, I quickly realized that Chicago, unfortunately to say, has a very un, a not ideal uh, road culture for riding oh, far from lots of road rage lots of congestion and even the roads are they're very straight very flat not really exciting for motorcycle riding and then i got hit by a car 
um, totally making a legal turn. It was rush hour. Somebody got hasty behind the wheel. Um, walking and T-boned me. Walking or no? I was, I, was, I, was, I was on my bike. Yeah. Oh man. I was making a left hand turn. Got hit. Miraculously wasn't hurt. Um, but it uh, it really really turned me off to riding in or around Chicago, which is a shame because I had just started calling it my home. And, uh, but I, I had a need to get around Chicago my garage was 2.1 miles. I measured it with a, uh, a Taylor's tape actually. <laughs> and, um, it's 2.1 miles. It took many Taylor tape lengths to figure that out <laughs> from, right. from my apartment where I live. And that's I, my apartment's down in the loop and my garage is in Wicker Park. It's basically like a 1930s two by four construction. It's 20 by 20. It's a, it's a shed and it's holy. I mean, <laughs> meaning it, it has, it has holes in it. <laughs> right. <laughs> so it's like when the wind blows, <laughs> it's drafty, but it's, it's my little slice of heaven. And I make several trips there sometimes even throughout a day, but definitely throughout a week between my apartment and on average, it'll take you 18 minutes if you're in a car or if it's fr five o'clock on a Friday, it could take 45 minutes. To go two and a half miles. Yeah. To go less, yeah. And so I, I went about trying to solve this problem. It's like, you know, should I get like a Grom or? And then I and then I thought about I had seen a couple of people, and it's actually become even more popular than this. Uh, put like a 110 cc or 125 cc on a BMX bike, and I was like, that would be cool because I really enjoy building my own frames. I think you know, just build it proper motorcycle especially custom motorcycle uh to get the line proportion etc especially if you're taking a little bit more of an artistic approach to it you have to start at the frame so that gave me the opportunity to design something new but then i started seeing a bunch of these little e-bike things coming up coming a little bit pop more popular this was 2017 um i moved to chicago in september of 2016 and um so i started sending out um, I went on Alibaba and I started pretending to be a young company, um, coming to market. Can you send me some samples? We're making prototypes, blah, blah, blah. And so they started sending me samples and I built a bike and I really didn't trust the components, you know, made in China. Mm -hmm. and whatnot. Um, but to my surprise, it, it worked and it worked pretty legit. And I only ordered like premium stuff and didn't look anything that seemed cut rate. I didn't even try for so I built this one thing and I just wanted to test the components. I wanted to see if it would work. And I put the battery and the motor and everything onto a BMX frame. I got it from offer up to 20 bucks and <laughs> just put everything together, see if it works. And it was like an instant epiphany, silence, speed, and stealth. It looks like a bike. So I actually brought it over to federal motor and a bunch of guys were hanging out there and it was just instant elation from everybody there. They're like, what is this thing? And it was far from perfect. This first one, like the rake and trail was wrong. It was super twitchy at speed, but it was a whole lot of fun. Was, and frankly, because it, it was a 20 inch BMX frame. So it was super small, short wheelbase. And the thing was like a windshield wiper. It was just so <laughs> wheelie happy. You'd breathe on the throttle and it would instantly lift the front wheel off the ground. Huh? So I, uh, I was like, well, this is a lot of fun, but that's not, proper riding <laughs> so <laughs> no. i redesigned it and i started interacting with factories once again and um it just snowballed and a friend of mine um he was the industrial designer lead industrial designer at skull candy headphones oh. an industrial designer by trade motorcyclist built a few of his own bikes not a builder just a you know a workshop tinker designer guy but with some serious chops and experience in um consumer products and he was like what are you what are you doing over there uh, what are you working on so we started talking blah blah and a couple months later just kind of like spit in our palms and stuck out our hands shook on it and zoos was born uh we didn't call it zoos at that time finding a name was incredibly difficult and it almost became a game like everything that we came up with was already taken and it's difficult because you got to have the website and your social handles, everything normalized, everything spelled the right way, same way, all that shit. And um, 
it was incredibly difficult. So we just started making up names. And my brother's nickname, my last name is Zahner. Uh, my first name is Chris. I was born in New York. And the most popular name for a male born in 1987 was Christopher. So growing up, there was always a bunch of Chris. I, went, I grew up playing hockey and there was a uh, one time there was five Chris's on the team. So naturally everybody goes by last names. Okay. Teachers always call me by my last name. Friends always call me by my last name. Even my brothers call me by my last name. So it's an <laughs> honor. But my brother's nickname was Zeus. Um, I don't know why, it's what it was. And it's not really why we chose it, but we like the kind of palindrome-esque uh, nature of the word. Two letters for you know, Z-O-O-Z, red backwards and forwards. It had some nice geometry to it, blah, blah, blah. So that's, that's how we came up with it. And frankly, you can say it however you want. <laughs> right. Hey, yeah, because today yeah. it was like, uh, Zeus, 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 Zeus. Yeah. yeah, so. Okay, so let's let's uh, take a second and let's go back because one of my questions for you was how you came up with the name. So that's, um, you took care of that. I, so, I ramble, man. Eventually, I'll touch on all the stones. You just got to wait for me to circle the yard. <laughs> I'm sure. So let's uh, let's circle the yard back to tell me about kind of the uh, series of events, um, like how you grew up. How did how do you even get to a, a, a point like this? Um, well, honestly, I'm first of all, I'm flattered that you would invite me on this uh, podcast. I really like what you're doing and the you. um, the insight that you don't get anywhere else into some of these uh, personalities, because not just builders um, is, is really cool. You know, with Instagram, you really get to eavesdrop on what people are doing, what projects are up to, but it's only what they're willing to project. And a lot of times you come up with these misconceptions almost of what people are like. Um, and I'm then, guilty of that know, too. Yeah. I, I look yeah, at but, and go, but, oh, but you, you completely open that up, which is really, really cool. And I've been listening to all of the podcasts that come about just of how it goes. And I'm not even beginning to answer your question. No, so let me fine. get to that. Um, Wait, you're flattering me. Go, go right ahead. Ramble out, ramble out. Yeah. <laughs> I, I really appreciate um, the kind words. Well, I, I, anyway, I'm flattered to be here. And, um, you know, I guess there's a kind of a builder heavy contingent and I'm, I'm really, um, I don't like to call myself a builder. Sure. I build motorcycles and I built several. Um, but it begets a kind of a, a, a connotation that you are a professional builder or you are on some certain portion of the pyramid. Right. And, mm -hmm. um, maybe I'm hiding behind that. Maybe I don't like to be there. I like to call myself a guy in a shed, which I do have the shed. It's a holy shed, I told you. Two guys, and, one um, shed. I've seen that video. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's you That's you and Craig. It's not me. It's just me and my shed, right? Leave me and my shed alone. <laughs> we can come visit anytime you want. Three guys, yeah. one shed. So, and and I think, uh, you know, for a guy in a shed, I, I, I do all right. But I, I, I don't, like, so I don't build bikes for anybody else. I don't build them to sell them. I don't, I hardly even post on Instagram anymore. I'm not trying to promote myself. I'm just... I have since the very beginning, like I've always been building things, making things, creating when you things. Say, when you and say from the beginning, what do you mean? Since I was a child, okay. like an infant almost. Um, and, and there's a series of steps that kind of led me to where I was. Cause I, I grew up in, I was born in Manhattan and my parents moved to the suburbs just outside, just North of the Bronx, New Rochelle, New York. Um, when they kind of realized that there was a second, and then ultimately a third on the way. So I grew up in the suburbs outside of New York and I didn't come from a motorcycling family. My dad had a, actually did have a Bonneville at some stage uh, back in, I guess would have been like the seventies and he had a Triumph TR4. So he, you know, he was interested in this stuff but he wasn't a gearhead by any, any real means, you know, an interest, an interest level and enthusiast but I didn't grow up like this. I was, I was just like the strange one in my family. Where's Chris? He's in the garage working with power tools, but isn't he five? <laughs> <laughs> and, and it just, it just, I don't know where it came from, but it was always that way. And um, I was lucky enough to find a bunch of nurturing, fostering uh, people along the way that kind of encouraged me to do some stuff. So um, 
there's actually a story that my mom likes to tell and i guess i'd like to tell because it kind of personifies it when my mom went into labor with my youngest brother who's six years younger to me almost to the day i was born january 22nd he's january 17th um they had to decide whether or not they were going to take me for this ordeal or uh you know going through labor and all that or leave me <laughs> with yeah, yeah. <laughs> or leave me with the babysitter. Now the problem right. wasn't leaving me with the babysitter. The problem was that I was in the basement using power tools to build a boat. Yeah. Now that boat never did float, but it was the thought that counted. And there were numerous downhill go-karts made out of wood. And then I, I, um, I got a welder. I conned my dad into buying me a welder um, when I was 12. And I taught myself how to weld with wow. the help of a neighbor who kind of knew how to weld and kind of pointed me in the right direction then off I was started building go-karts that way um and just whatever I could get my hands on and that's really how it started that and there was actually now I'm really rambling but it it really also started there was this unique individual in my neighborhood his name was Mr. Pond the neighborhood that I grew up in my house that I grew up in was built in 1930. But previous to that, that neighborhood didn't really exist. It was all woods, except for this one house, Mr. Pond's house, who's born in that house. World War II vet, retired school teacher, and he would put on displays for all of the holidays, right? On his front lawn, personal displays. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the two biggest ones were Halloween and Christmas. Halloween by far the biggest. And thousands of people from the entire area would come and visit this thing. And he had a graveyard and a haunted house. And he was doing this like decades before these haunted houses, you know, where everybody goes and whatever on his personal property with his own money. And all the kids from the neighborhood would come and help. He also turned his driveway into a basketball court. And this is old world shit. This seems like creepy in the 2000s, like going sure. over this old man's house and he has games for you to play and shit. Like sounds really weird, but it's like this. And like all the neighborhood would go there and they would really play basketball, street hockey, whatever. And like parents in the neighborhood knew they were safe and he was looking after them. Right. But he was working on setting up these displays and stuff. And by five or six years old, I was like site foreman. And <laughs> I was telling kids how I was teaching kids twice my age at that point, how to swing a hammer, saw, use a, a circular saw, uh, et cetera. And um, it was like putting gasoline on a fire. <laughs> And I was just, I was over there. I would go straight right off the bus. I wouldn't even go home. I'd just go straight there. And then like later on, uh, you know, teenage started catching up with me and I had slightly different interests. And I, I, was, a, I was a handful as a kid. I, I would even, I wasn't a bad kid, but I got in a lot of trouble. Like with, with the police trouble. Right. And, um, <laughs> I might not strike you as that, but I did. And um, <laughs> I know you're a convict. Don't so, worry. So, so my mom, uh, she's like, I got to get this kid into another place to channel his energy. And another old school kind of, I don't know if it's a New York thing, but an older world thing that doesn't really exist anymore. We just uh, like about a mile away was a auto service station. They had a gas station, a mechanic shop, a body shop. And it was family run and you had like a charge account. So anyway, that's where she went, had a, you know, a friendly customer relationship with them and um, basically got me a job at this auto body shop, starting off sweeping the floors. Well, with, mm -hmm. within a couple months, I was painting cars. Um, and the owner of that shop had a son. He was 21 at that age at that time. And I had just it was like it was like three days after my 14th birthday. So once again, like happier than a pig in shit. And it just kind of evolved, uh, still friends with those guys. I ended up building a car there. I built it, I built my last go-kart there. Uh, and I started wow. um, right when I entered uh, high school, not shortly thereafter, like the next year, this is when people started having cell phones, uh, mm -hmm. like in high school people. So that was, um, Actually, it's like my third day of high school was 9-11. So it was 2001 when I started high school. And um, people started having cell phones at that time. Kids, high schoolers had cell phones. And so I started a little racket uh, 
painting cell phones, doing custom paint jobs on cell phones. <laughs> and everybody in this area, if you're from New York at that time, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Everybody had the Nextel. Do you remember those things? Yeah. It was like of for construction workers that had the um, walkie talkie, yes, obnoxious as hell. But we were obnoxious, so it was a perfect fit. Right. And and so I, I started some entrepreneurialism thing going on, just trying to like mash all my stuff together. And that's really what set the tone for the next few successions of like, well, there's Mr. Pond and the auto body shop. And then it, then it started to kind of rapidly evolve. Um, and at this time, like within high school, this is when uh, Monster Garage, American Chopper, um, uh, what was the Jesse James ones? Um, Motorcycle Mania and Biker Build Off were on TV. And this was, I mean, obviously the internet was a thing, but it was not, you weren't disseminating information the way that you have now, where you can just right. go find your own little niche within a hashtag search. It, you know, we're still watching TV. And this was like, oh, this is fucking awesome. This is what I need to do. Now, I had ridden like a little pit bike, mini bike here and there, but never ridden motorcycles, never had access to one forbidden by my family whatever but i was like this is this is rad i was always into cars before but then this started to capture my attention the two-wheel thing so this was like high school still had other interests i was playing ice hockey was chasing girls and driving around um you know causing mischief whatever but this was always like an internal passion and then um at this time you know it's had to go to school it was like a family requisite had to go to college so mm -hmm. and i was not I a school story. kid right. i was not a school kid I, I i have add and if it doesn't capture my attention i'm not 100 percent enthralled very difficult to keep my attention so you can imagine how my coursework went in high school mm -hmm. so uh my mom was like please like you have to go you can study whatever you want you go wherever you want um, you know, within reason, within cost. Um, right. But basically wherever it would take me. But I learned about this thing called Formula SAE, which is SAE is the Society of Automotive Engineers. Um, and this is basically Formula SAE is an intercollegiate extracurricular uh, program for colleges where engineering students come together and conceptualize design, build, and then race a formula style race car. You have a rule book and um, you know, it's like there's a bunch, there's like chassis team, suspension team, exhaust team, aero team, and it's usually the senior design project. Um, and they come together, they build this thing, and then you go to Detroit, Michigan and race against all the other schools. Oh, At the time yeah. it's like 150 schools and it's grown significantly and it's worldwide for quite a long time now. But I found out about this thing in high school, and I was like, I am only going to a school that has this. And I basically, long story short, chose my school based on the team, one out of the schools I could get into <laughs> with man. my shitty grades. I had a 2.0 average, 2.07 weighted average. How I got into school, I don't know, but I did. I <laughs> uh, went to Old Dominion University in Norfolk, Virginia, Virginia State School. And I chose it because the team was just consisted of good old boys. And I was like, this is awesome. No, like, sign in to go to the garage or whatever. It was just super, super casual. And long story short, while the seniors had done all the work to design this thing, they didn't really want to do much beyond that besides party, much less build the car. So I basically built the car my freshman year. Um, wow. I built the um, – I had been MIG welding for several years, but I hadn't TIG welded. And so I showed up on day one, like before school even started, like you show up on a Friday, classes start the following Wednesday. I show up on a Friday, nobody's there yet. I go up Saturday, nobody's there yet. Sunday, nobody's there yet. Monday, finally, somebody's there. I'm like, I'm Chris, I want to join the team. Da, 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 da. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, well, can you weld? I was like, I can MIG weld, but I know that's not good enough. I have to learn how to TIG weld. Do you have a TIG welder? I'm going to start TIG welding. I'm like, uh, it's, it's over there. Go ahead. So I spent the next three days, like, learning how to TIG weld and I picked it up because I had the concepts down, had it good enough. And then finally, by the time we started building the car, like a month later, we were good to go. So I built the chassis with like a month worth of experience TIG welding and they were decent. There, there, there was oversight. 
so like it wasn't it wasn't dangerous or anything but <laughs> right they were they were just as passable welds as anybody else on the team so <laughs> i built the frame i built the suspension i built the exhaust I helped with some of the aero um and it was just a rad time but it like after a year i had kind of seen the kind of gone full arc and then I almost punched somebody in the face and that I was like, all right, t time to time to exit. And, um, a guy several years before, uh, who basically created the FSA, um, program at my school dropped out of school and started working at a hot rod shop, just a few blocks from school. Mm -hmm. And the hot rod shop was owned by this old, old timer. Uh, allegedly he's kind of, well known within hot rodding circumstances, but I think he's like 80 at this point. His name is <laughs> Alan Thornton, and he owned this hot rod shop called Flatlanders. And like I was this just like super exuberant helper kid. Uh, the guy that I mentioned that created this formula program, or really just kind of grew it, uh, had the talent and the skill and the determination to do it, switched to this hot rod shop. And by the time I was ready to leave Formula SAE, after just one year, after my freshman year, this, uh, the older dude, Alan was getting out of the business and sold it. And Aaron, the guy who became my friend, he became the owner of this place. Yeah. So I showed up like, Hey man, I'll sweep the floors. I'll paint the walls. I don't care. Let me just, you know? And, um, so he did. And I spent like five years there in a hot Holy rod shop with a lathe and a, 26 inch throat band saw and a eight inch break finger break um and all the tools and everything and allowed me to put my hands on stuff i had no business touching and that was like quantum leap um in terms of really learning how to do shit and do shit right and uh i would say that there was guidance but it was more like he let me fuck shit up certain things right. and then be like you uh so what did you learn <laughs> you know <Right. laughs> and, and that's kind of and i've just kind of been doing that forever i realize that's long-winded just like i have some certain obsession in my head and i go and i do it and when i fuck it up i learn how to do it better and then i just do it better and right. then it becomes slightly passable and it usually performs much better than it ever should have it at my behest right no that's awesome though so yeah. then after you leave the hot rod shop uh, where do you go from there oh um well I, I mean at that point i was fully addicted to bending metal and building things oh so at that um formula sae thing like the first week somebody on the team showed up on a motorcycle it's a katana 600 um and it's like, do you want to ride the, ride the motorcycle? And this was the nature of the good old boys down there. Like, I didn't care. Didn't ask if I had a license or whatnot. I was like, hell yeah. Hell yeah. And I instantly just take off on this thing. And I was like, yep, this is for me. I need a motorcycle. I know. I'll build it. <laughs> <laughs> of course you will. Right. Don't buy one. Don't ease into it. Just head first, deep end. No problem. Right. So the hot rod shop allowed me to do that. And I built my first motorcycle frame up. I built a frame jig, fully adjustable frame jig. I still have it to this day. Um, it's incredibly useful and um, built my first frame. I, the tank, uh, I cut up a 1980 XR 500 tank, like six ways from Sunday and reshaped it. You would never recognize it, but had a really cool shape. Um, definitely in, uh, inspired by the kind of West Coast choppers, Jesse James style, uh, Frisco style, but had a very unique, it was based around um, a Kawasaki KZ750 twin motor. Um, and it was pretty gnarly and it, it, it rode and it ran. It, it would kill you from vibration, but <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, it was, you know, so it certainly wasn't perfect. But it was awesome, and that that just kind of kicked it off. But uh, life kind of took a left-hand turn. My uh, senior year, I studied abroad. I was lucky enough to go study in Barcelona. Uh -huh. um, my brother was there, 
uh, in the same program. He did it for a year. I did it for just the spring semester. So he was already there for like five months before I showed up. And he was like, this place is awesome. You're gonna have a great time, but our, our program and all the people in it suck. And I realized that pretty quickly. It's like a bratty study abroad program. And you know, I don't, I don't mind sharing that information, but it's like, it's like a pay, pay to play type thing. Like I said, I was fortunate enough to go. And, um, it's like accredited through the university of new Haven. And it was like offsite. Like we, we went to class in an office, a rented office building. It was bullshit, but it got you there and got transferable credits. So fuck it, why not? Right. Why but not? it was filled with like bratty snobby kids from like New York, Chicago, San Francisco, LA. And that was it. So you can almost imagine the type, like I said, I pay the play, right? And uh, I really didn't enjoy it. So I was forced to go out and find and make my own friends, literally on the street in Barcelona. And I had very low functioning Spanish, but I got along and it just kind of blew my mind to travel, general wanderlust kind of just dropping into a random place where you hardly speak the language and making friends and having a blast. It was, it just blew my mind. So I got bit by the travel bug quite, quite hard. And um, I returned, I was like, this is what I have to do for the rest of my life. I just have to go travel. I just have to travel, man. And so I went back and I, I, I went back to school. I had to finish some stuff, uh, some classes. And then, this whole time I had been working in restaurants. Uh, I loved the cash and carry idea. Go in, bust your ass. And there were, there were nicer restaurants. Mm -hmm. um, so you could get a substantial yield per night. And I was luckily enough to do that with, without the knowledge of Mr. Mm -hmm. Sam, Uncle mm -hmm. Sam. So I netted all of that and funneled it all into my projects and then travel. And I started so I went back to school, graduated, immediately started working and saving up to go travel again. And I flew to Portugal with the idea of uh, a one-way ticket to Portugal with the idea of going as far as I could east by whatever means necessary. I had $5,800. <laughs> and eight and a half months later, I find myself in Nepal. <laughs> no way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Holy shit. Right. So, I mean, there's a lot of details and fun stories along the way. But yeah, that's we fucking crazy, We don't have to go into all of that. So, yeah, I did that, and um, I, uh, I, f I fell in love with this German girl along the way. Um, and I went to Nepal, and we'll get into that in a second, but I went to Nepal, and uh, I didn't do any really studying about it. I just I found a super cheap flight there from Turkey. So I really made it to Turkey and then found a super fl cheap flight. There's an app called Skyscanner. And at the time, I don't know if you can still do it, but you can put in your where you're coming from and type in anywhere and it will give you all the cheapest flights. So I got like a $87 flight from uh, Istanbul to Kathmandu, Nepal. And so I was like, I'll take that one. <laughs> and uh, you got some so balls, I, man. Or no brains. Right. I, I was gonna say or or stupid. <laughs> Either yeah. way it's good with me. So I um so I I I booked a ticket and it was like two days and I went on to Wiki Travel just to get a general idea. <laughs> Wiki Travel is like the brief, it's like the cliff notes of what's going on. And it in there it says Royal Enfield motorcycles. There's a lot of them. I'm like, Royal Enfield, Royal Enfield, Royal Enfield. Isn't that that English motorcycle? And aren't there a lot of them in India? Because I'd spent a lot of time on forums, uh, very much a lurker on the internet. So I have my ear to the ground. Seriously, I'm like Squanto, paying attention <laughs> to the, the encroaching tribes. Right. And, um, <laughs> and even since the beginning, like on the Jockey Journal and then Chop Call and then Instagram took over and just kind of changed the whole landscape. But um, so I kind of knew about it from that, but I didn't know anything else about it. So I, I went there and I went in search of of Royal Enfield motorcycle to ride. And I was in, I did a trek and then I ended up in uh, Pakura, Nepal, which is, if you ever travel to Nepal, it's like one of the places you go. Beautiful lake in the, in the like in the foothills of the Himalayas. It's yeah. fantastic. 
And uh, there was a guy that rented stuff there. He was an American guy, kind of expat, living the life. And um, I went to his place. It's called Hearts and Tears. And he um, he was not there. And somebody told me that he was back in the States getting cancer treatment, which is a bummer. But I was like, shit, how am I going to find this fucking motorcycle? I'm going to ride a motorcycle. And uh, somebody says, well, there's this mechanic guy up the street. His name is Raju. So I go up and I start talking to Raju. We end up talking for like three hours. And he tells me like his whole oral history of the Royal Enfield motorcycle, how it came to India and how he has like generations and generations of counterparts of other mechanics and like stalwarts of uh, the Royal Enfield motorcycle in India. And it was just like, for me, it was a fascinating story. We got on the bike, rode it around for the day, didn't even charge me for it. Really nice guy. Okay. Um, and that was that. So anyway... As I mentioned, I had fallen in love with this German girl and I left Nepal and moved back, moved to Germany to stay with her. I was on my tourist visa in Europe. You can stay for 90 days without a visa, but any longer you have to get a visa, blah, blah, blah. And my time was kind of counting and I had already kind of sensed that this thing wasn't really going to work out anyway. But one of the ideas for me to stay was to go back to school. And I was like, listen, Missy, I don't do school. <laughs> Right. But like that time, it was like, well, if I was to go back to school, what would I do? And I don't know why I hadn't learned about this earlier, but I learned about what industrial design was mm -hmm. and that motorcycle designers and car designers are industrial designers and that there's a whole school of thought and a method and universities <laughs> and all this other stuff. So ding, I started ding, looking ding, at ding. all that and um, I found um i found this interesting school because i didn't want to go back to school i didn't want to go back to university i didn't want to do all of that like I, I got a degree in history and film studies from old dominion university which i never really intended on using um <laughs> at, at the at the time uh when i chose my major like the beginning of my sophomore year so I, I went in mechanical engineering technology which is like the, the, the little brother and because i was like i want to build shit Right. And I took okay. chemistry and <laughs> six weeks in, I, I was like, nope, can't do math, switch my major. History it is. And because um, I, I actually really do like it. And I actually learned how to school. And uh, finally, by my senior year, and I started doing well, I got, I think I got like a 3.5 my final semester. I was stoked. For me, that may as well have been like a, a 4.5. I don't think you right. can get that. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, I found this design Academy. These are kind of popular in in uh, Italy, especially is these private academies, and they give you a certificate. What that is worth is up to you, really. It's kind of cash and carry, right? As they tell <laughs> you, yeah, yeah, you know, you go, you come hang out, and then you leave. <laughs> um, but I found this interesting place, uh, and the way it operates is kind of like an atelier, which is a French term for kind of like a studio where artists who already have some skills come to study under a master and develop themselves. And so really, that's really how it functions. Like if you didn't show up to class, they didn't care. If you showed up to class and didn't do the work, they didn't care. But if you wanted to do the work, they would cultivate your stuff. And I wanted to, again, this was in my traveling phase. I wanted to just spend as much time out of the country as possible and meet other people. And this it was an in, um, international design school kind of ghetto right. so I was like this is for me this is the good old boys <laughs> of design in Italy <laughs> perfect and um so I went there and it was like the, the price of a community college it's like six thousand bucks for the year wow right so I was like okay I'll go I'll here I get my year visa I'll stay and there's like 150 people in the school or something like that and like three Americans and everybody else was from all over the world, like Moldova, Argentina, Seychelles Islands, China, New Zealand, everywhere. So I oh, was like, love this, that. This, this, this awesome. I had such a great time. I call that the best year of my life. 2013, I did a spring semester and then a fall semester with summer in between. I was trying to stay in Europe during that time. I wasn't able to, I had to go back to the uh, States. I uh, had to work, had to make some money. So I had some beer drinking money. And that's really all I did. Like I partied 
made friends, hung out in Florence, Italy, and did this kind of like design vacation thing at school. And it was very, very loose. So Sounds that was awesome. completely awful. Yeah, that's awful. That's terrible. Yeah. Yeah, I feel and, bad for you on that one. I know, man. And I'm only sharing it so as nobody else stumbles into the same predicament. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know? You're, you're teaching. Um, you're teaching. But as this, as this, just before this was happening, I was starting to getting interested in uh, making videos, like little stupid videos. Mm -hmm. um, and right before I left, the GoPro Hero 3 came out. Now, mm -hmm. I don't know if you're, if anybody's really familiar with the GoPro, of course, no, probably know what it is, but this was right. like the quantum leap in their product. I bought and it the day it came out. Same. Do you remember that video? Mm -hmm. I nearly shat my pants. I was like, holy fuck, I'm going to make these videos. Right. <laughs> this is mine so, and I'm doing this. <laughs> and it came out right before I went to Italy. So I went and I brought one. I put it in my pocket. I carried it everywhere I went. And I made a bunch of videos of me and my friends dicking around in Florence. And it was a lot of fun. And I'm glad we have those keepsakes. But there were just, you know, silly videos of me and my friends. Nothing really worth watching for strangers but that was right. kind of like the point by the end of it i was like i want to make something i want to make something that's worth watching maybe like a documentary or something but i also want to find a way to like bring in together all of my interests traveling motorcycles and filmmaking how could i do that and i remember i was um we were doing a we had a personal branding project um uh, in, in school and in design school in Florence. And I came up with this idea. I was like, yeah, I want to, I want to start a personal brand about how I, uh, bring together my th own three interests so that it directly affects and benefits me. <laughs> and everybody's looking at me like, uh, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. so, so I, I exited that. Like I got home right before Christmas 2013 and I was like, what could I do? What could I do? What could I do? Aha. I'm going to go produce a documentary in India about the history of the Royal Enfield in India. Very cool. So it all comes full circle. Very cool. And I was like, okay, I haven't produced a documentary before. Hmm. I haven't been to India before. I don't really know much about the Royal Enfield. And I don't have any of this stuff that you need besides this GoPro to make a video. And I'm pretty sure that's not sufficient. So sounds, sounds I, like a great idea to me. I'll do it tomorrow. Right. So I spent all of 2014 um, practicing the documentary method of shooting people and taking their stories, editing it into a cohesive narrative learning cameras and lighting and all that other stuff and figuring out how I'm going to fit all of this into a carry on Pelican case and strap it to a motorcycle and ride around India and do all this stuff all the while working, saving all of this stuff. And I also at that time launched a Kickstarter campaign to produce a GoPro handle that we called the go ball is an idea between my design professor and I, but the whole idea of launching it on Kickstarter or creating in the first place was to practice Kickstarter so that right. you could, so that I could kickstart the, the, Royal Enfield film, which I did. And in true dramatic fashion, I set up the Kickstarter. I had actually gone to India first for three weeks, met some people, started sending a bunch of messages out to India. Some bounce back, start, you know, selling this idea that I'm coming. Right. And um, so I go for three weeks, I meet some people, I shoot some stuff, I come back, I produce a Kickstarter campaign, I set a goal, $10,000, and I'm like pushing, pushing, pushing friends, family, blogs, whatever I can do. And I fall up short on Kickstarter. If you don't reach your goal, you at the get end nothing. Of it, nobody gets charged. You don't get anything. Right. And so, um, I didn't get anything. And in true dramatic fashion, I had the Kickstarter campaign end like 20 hours before my flight to India. Ugh. So I got on the plane anyway. Yeah. Good for you, brother. And I, I only had, I had like 2,300 bucks. Now, luckily the dollar goes quite far in India. And I already had a few friends from design school. There was actually quite a significant Indian contingent in this design school. So like I had a 
friend to crash with in, in New Delhi for the first couple of weeks and kind of get my stuff going. But, and there are, India is incredible. How long has it been? How long have we been talking? Oh, I just wrote down, we're at 50. Oh, Jesus. I just, I just wrote 50 <sighs> okay on my piece of paper. For editing purpose, I'm like, okay, so we're at 50 minutes and we're perfect. I'm gonna write that. Hold on, 50. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna zoom through here. Yeah, finish that, and then when you're done with that, I'm gonna ask you a question. Okay. okay. So we started. Um, there's there's a very interesting thing going on in India uh, with motorcycle because with motorcycles because it had a rich tradition already, but accessibility. To motorcycles from a financial standpoint was not for the masses and in the past especially the past 10 but 20 years that has begun to change the middle class has been exploding and so accessibility to you know big powerful toys basically what motorcycles are uh yeah. had grown and the brand presence has started and so now everybody's there uh, ducati harley Kawasaki, et cetera. Everybody's there just like they are here. But a long time ago, it was just Royal Enfield. And Harley was actually the first one to move in there. Um, and then everybody else. But just a few years ago, there was not this whole culture like we're used to, where like it's a mature market and then all the brands are there and there's a secondary market, but not there, there was nothing. But then all of a sudden there was something. So it started at its infancy and it's growing at breakneck speed and it happened at the same time that Instagram and Facebook really started oh. growing. So I kind of got in there at the beginning, but there were already some established personalities and I was able to sell the idea to one or two of them, like get them on board with this idea. And they're like, yep, we're going to help you. And okay. <laughs> in Indians, man, they are the most gentle, kind and caring population I've ever met really? to generalize an entire country's population, which probably shouldn't do. But in this case, I'm happy to do it because those are the facts. And I just had this idea as like, kind of a build it, if you build it, they will come. But like, I knew that the dollar would stretch far. I knew that people were kind. I knew that there was this tight community of motorcycling. And that if you just kind of get the ball rolling, it would happen. And that's exactly what happened. So I spent six months there, interviewed all types of people, including the CEO of Royal Enfield, actually the parent company, Aisher Motors, Siddharth Lal. Uh, he actually didn't end up in the film, um, but it was an incredible ride. I called my time in Italy the best year of my life. Yeah. This was the best six months of my life. Wow. And it was it, and i popped out the other side with enough content to produce a documentary and that's what i have it's on youtube now you can find it, yeah, it has hundreds say, of where, thousands of views where do our friends see it that are listening it's called chasing the bullet chasing just type in chasing the bullet. the bullet it'll be the first result it has hundreds right. of thousands of views it's become kind of a cult film mainly in india Right. If you look at my Instagram, I have like 5,000 followers. 95% of them are in. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, All right. I'm yeah. going to stop you because we need to shift gears here real quick. Yeah, yeah. Go for it. I told you, All man, right. if you don't stop me. <laughs> I'm going to pour a drink really quick. 5340. All right. Let me pour a drink. I got go I got a it. refill just because you don't have anything. <laughs> 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 ha, 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 ha. I love it. Oh. I got to get an airplane in four hours. I'll beat you. Oh, my God. Where are you at? I'm in Redondo Beach, California. Nice. Nice, nice, nice. All right. This is bad. I ran out of all my mixers. So I yeah. got this. I got this uh, Mi mixers I are for pussies and old men like you. I know. I cut up <laughs> lemons, and I make lemon water all day. And me and my son drink, like, gallons and gallons of lemon water. Oh. But when I it gets down to the... You. Yeah, if it gets down to the end, it's almost like lemonade. Uh, no calories, nothing. So, yeah, plus vodka oh. does the body good. More vodka, <clears> less. <throat> yeah. All right. Uh, right. Okay. All right. So switching gears, brother. I want to. Um, I want to talk more about the e-bike. 
really quick. Okay. Um, okay. I've read some of your posts and I, I've seen some of these comments and seen some comments that you posted. So, um, what are the common misconceptions about this Zeus bike that you've made? Well, uh, if, if you look at it and you know anything about bicycles, uh, you'll say, oh, that's that's a BMX. And it certainly has a um, very obvious BMX influence. Um, yes, for sure. But one of the common misconceptions is that it's it's for BMXing. This is the verb that people like to use. It's for BMXing. <laughs> it's like, well, actually, it's really not. And the proportions, it's much larger than a BMX. Um, it's, it's really just mobility, you know, like, final mile transportation, e-mobility. Um, and for me, it fit me really well because I needed, I needed something like this to get around town. And I didn't want to stop at stoplights. I wanted to be able to ride in any portion of the road or not road that there was. Right. And this thing just opened it all up. And the bike that we're selling now, uh, we're pre-selling. We've already started manufacturing a um, hundred of them. It's the first batch. Right. So we started pre-selling them. We actually, things have been happening really quickly. We might have an investor that's like pulling out the pen right now. Uh, just met with a digital agency, marketing agency. Things are moving really, really quickly, but it started just as a need to get around town. And this is a rapidly expanding segment. Like if you look up any Huge. articles, Deloitte is one of the big consulting firms in, in the world. It's one of the big four. And um, they produced they produced a study December 19th. This is just like, you know, two months ago. They project that there will be 130 million electric bike sales in the next three years. What? Which means in the, in the next 34 months from today, you know, or in the past two months, by that rate, they've already sold, you know, like, I don't know, five, five million, something like that. Unbelievable. Or three million projected, you know, but it, there's other studies saying that electric bicycles will outpace all other electric vehicles, including cars combined by a factor of six to one what? over the next three years. Oh my God. You're in the right business, brother. Right. And I'm seeing this and I'm seeing how it affected my use case. And I see that it's cropping up everywhere. And this is two wheels. This is two wheels with power on demand. This is something that only motorcyclists have, but now other people have access to it too. But if you look at a lot of the other e-bikes out there, they're wholly uninspiring. They're dorky and they, <laughs> And and let's I just be, couldn't. Let's just be honest here, Chris. Though, tell me how you really feel. I couldn't <laughs> stand by and watch this happen. <laughs> right. So I so I thought I thought I was like you know, this doesn't have to be that way. They can be powerful. They can be inspiring. They can be evocative, and they can be far more impactful than the two wheeler has ever been on a general population than ever before. And I'm not saying this multi right you know the millions of employees of consultants around the world are saying this you know mckinsey and deloitte and boston consulting group and all this other shit they're like red alarm lots of money to be made this so i was like yeah right. sure money's great that's not my motivation my motivation is there is an another chapter of the legacy of two wheels coming we can't let them fuck this up Correct. so i was like well shit I can do this. <laughs> and yeah. who am I? Who am I? Nobody. A, a, guy, a guy that tries but shit, apparently. A guy, a guy in the shed with big balls and no brain. So I just kind of put all of it as like, I can produce some content. I can build the bikes. I can build all the concept bikes. I already started the relationships with the factories in China and Taiwan. And it comes, uh, everything comes from all over. But uh, the supp supply chains were there, blah, blah, blah. So anyway... Um, my business partner, Pete, um, as I mentioned in the beginning, he, uh, contacted me. He was like, let's start this thing. We got all our supply chains up. We quickly cobbled, cobbled together an Indiegogo campaign. I swore I'd never do another one of those things again, but here I am. He set a really high goal with really high margins. Didn't reach it, but it was a blessing in disguise because we got a whole 
lot of feedback. Nice. And we spent the last year taking all of that feedback. My, my wife uh, is a um, research designer. She designs how to do research for user-based qualitative metrics, whether you're designing a business or an app or whatever. She actually works for one of these consulting groups. She works wow. for Accent and, Extension. And a very lovely woman, by the way. Yeah, she's all right. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I love you, babe. Um, she, um, so we, we synthesized all of this data, all these touch points, and we redesigned the whole bike um, based on all of this stuff. So we really have what we consider to be a substantial and good product. And this is really just the beginning of what we expect to snowball of what, what I want to do, Dave, mm -hmm. what I want to do is explore this space between bicycle and motorcycle, something that I'm calling ultra light. And it's a powered two wheeler, which means motorcycle, but it is very different from a motorcycle because at this moment, you can get away with anything. You don't have to register it. You don't have to have a license. Sure, there's certain levels that they're more powerful, they're technically illegal, but nobody knows. Right. You can do whatever you want. I, I ride on sidewalks. I ride by the golden rule, but I ride on any surface of the city that I want. I go anywhere that I want, unencumbered by stop signs or street lights or police officers. It's silent, it's stealthy, and it is swift. And so I really want to explore what this is. Now this product that we have, that's the general consumption product. What's going to kick off some sales, some revenue, some cash flow, so that we can really start exploring this area that I'm really interested in. And we've already built several concept bikes, which we haven't started messaging about yet. And that'll fit in at a certain point in the near future. But um, it's really been exciting. It's, enveloped my entire mind and heart for the past two years and here we are on the precipice and it looks like it might work out i gotta find some wood real quick but right. no, I'm <laughs> kidding let me it's let me tell been you a whirlwind man let me tell our listeners something really cool so i've actually had what is the model of the spike that i have here so we're calling uh, we, we didn't really want to name the model we just want to get the name of our company out there but we're calling okay. it the urban ultralight all right, so I have the that, Urban Ultralight at my home right now, and <laughs> I'm going. I'm going to tell you. Well, it's all in one piece. Actually, it's in two pieces because the front wheel really nice comes right off and easily transported. It's a quick car. release. It's meant to do that for our yeah. listeners. Yeah, quick release. <laughs> since I, I'm a, I'm I'm the technical guy, by the way. Um, but I'm going to tell you what. I'm going to get one of these bikes from you um, for one reason and one reason only. Because one of my questions was who needs the spike. But I'm telling you, my son is from, it's maybe two miles from here to baseball practice. Now, for me, as a single dad of three, I don't have time to run him back and forth and do everything. He doesn't have a driver's license. So this morning, 6 a.m., he puts his backpack on with his baseball bats, and he gets to school before anybody else does um, in their cars or anything else because it's a quick shot there. And, of course, there's you know, 20 kids around him asking him what the hell he's driving. Um, but I'll tell you what, I don't have to buy this kid a car. I don't have to do shit. Um, and he thinks he's cool as hell and he can get back. And, and you don't for... have to buy insurance. You don't have to buy uh... gas. You don't have to pay for speeding tickets. You don't have to bail him out of jail. And this no. is fantastic, Dave, because I never, I mean, we're coming up, we're realizing more and more use cases every, every single day. But this is a brilliant thing. And this really, this is a vehicle, no pun intended, that can really change how people move around. You might and sell five the, of those today just for this And use. this is the best this part. Is a weird use. And this is the best part. You have just put somebody on two wheels with power on demand that otherwise never would have been there. Now, if they stay on electric bikes or they move to cycling or they move to motorcycles, whatever they want to do, it's a beautiful thing. And the motorcycle industry talks about this all the time. Not so much the custom scene, because that's its own little ecosystem. But if you look at the motorcycle sales, the CEO of Harley Davidson just stepped down a couple days ago. He got canned because he wasn't delivering this new, the growth on this pivot that they've made. And it's obvious. And everybody's scratching their heads. And I think they made the right call. But sales have been incrementally shrinking across the board 
for the past 20 years and it's still going in that direction even though the industry is producing the best motorcycles they've ever produced with the most engaged audience yet sales are going down mm. and we see the sales of e-bikes going up and this is just the beginning what's it going to be in five years and 10 years and 20 years and if anybody should have their hands on the reins it should be us the right. people who know better so i'm like fucking a if nobody else is going to do it i'm going to do it and here we are yeah, brother hell yeah no i think it's i think it's wonderful and um I think that I'm going to use your product um, as uh, maybe my gateway drug to uh, finally get another motorcycle. <laughs> a gateway will, drug indeed. Uh, I know. And I, I, I think that I may have to have a Kickstarter for my health insurance or something like that. But um, yeah, but no, what a, it's, it's a cool vehicle. So how, okay. So my kids got it here. We live two miles from school. How yeah. many, how far does this go? On one battery? So so um, in, in the e-bike space, you see all types of outlandish claims with an omnipresent asterisk. And I say, fuck the asterisk. Right. So I like to give a benchmark minimum. And so as tested on flat land, full throttle, which is ju you're just dumping all the energy out, right? Out of the battery. Um, flat land, full 200 pound rider, me, gets a minimum of 25 miles Ugh. range. If you are steering minimum, with the minimum. throttle or you pet, yes. Okay. If you pedal a little bit, if you um, are easy with the throttle, if you're coasting a bit, you can extend that quite a bit. Um, and the beautiful thing is like, if you're running around town, you have to run errands, do not get on a regular internal combustion vehicle because you're going to spend three times as much time. It's going to be a hassle and you're going to hate it. Right. Like think about like anybody's commute. They're stuck in traffic. They come home about to have a heart attack because they're having road rage with all the other cars around them. Or you could go the same whatever five, six mile distance as the average, you know, commute is near an urban center and have fun, get some exercise, spend a whole lot less money. Here's an, here's some arithmetic for you. You asked about the range. Let's talk about yeah. the total cost of ownership. So I've yeah. done the math. If your car gets 40 miles to the gallon, which is a very yeah. efficient vehicle very, on the very, highway, very, right? Yeah. At $3 per gallon, you're getting 10 cents per mile. At now, right now, right. at 40 miles a gallon, you're getting 10 cents per mile. Now, we are currently selling this bike on our website, pre-selling. It's currently being manufactured. We're delivering in June. We're se selling it at a cut rate price, an MSRP 2500 right now selling at twenty seven or seventeen ninety nine with shipping included. So at eighteen hundred bucks. Damn. And and the the battery gets eight hundred to a thousand cycles before you have to replace it, right? So that's full charge to full discharge. Um that's one cycle. Wow. Let's call it eight hundred. So at eight hundred uses before you have to replace the battery, at twenty five miles per charge, you're getting eight cents to the mile instead of ten. And then you replace the battery for 600 bucks and then you're getting three cents per mile. Now with any internal combustion engine, that's just the gas mileage, not the cost of the car or the motorcycle, not the cost of insurance, not the cost of oil changes, Regi tires, uh, registration, registration, uh, parking pass, etc. Right, right. So if you're running around town or you making these little zip, you get on one of these things, you have a blast going wherever you're going. You can walk this thing into stores. Nobody cares. It's a bicycle. You can put it in an elevator. It's a bicycle. And it's a sweet looking bicycle. So people give you a pass. You show up in like, you know, like big clunky bicycle. Like, ah, oh, you can't bring that in here. This thing, everybody's like, whoa, that's a nice <laughs> <Right>. bike. <laughs> right. I was just riding. I was just riding. it. We, we had a meeting today. My business partner, we were riding around uh, like by the seaside. Some dude stopped us like, Amazing story. One-legged man on a Segway. Just retired. He has awesome, like, ATV tires. He's going around. He goes, that's a nice bike. So we stopped. We talked to him. He's like, I've been looking for something like that. Kind of low seat, comfortable. Because I got this leg, man. It doesn't work. And he, points <laughs> to he, has, right. like, he has a full-length prosthetic. He actually right. lost it in a, in a – he was riding an old ATC, those three-wheeler 
um, quad looking things going yep. down a steep hill in, at nighttime and like laid there all night until somebody found him. They had to amputate his leg. Oh, so shit. he's been like this. He said, he said he's 64. He did this when he was 32. So half his life he's been like this, but it obviously hadn't slowed him down at all. And he's on this Segway killing it at life. And um, so he's like, I'm going to buy one of these things. And this is kind of the thing. Like some people get it quicker. Some people don't get it. But once anybody sits on this thing, they're sold. And it's only a matter of time before it's like the, it's like the microwave, man. Everybody's going to have a microwave, but this is not the microwave. Right. People don't match their microwave to their outfit. It's not an extension of their personality, but the automobile, the motorcycle, the bicycle, the handbag, the Air Jordans, the hats, the clothes, that's a different story. And that's what this is. We're making something evocative that breaks down that barrier of saying, going from not for me to I want that. And then they get on it and then it inspires them to ride more. Correct. And then, and then you're affecting change. Right. And so no. that's, I mean, my son wants to know if he, my son fun, wants man. to know if he can work on commission. He'll just ride it around town, and if he sells like ten of them for you, then he 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 wants one. If he sells ten of them, I'll give him one. That's for okay. sure. If he sells right. ten of them at this stage, you don't so it's, don't it's... don't tell him that he'll be out tomorrow, like peddling your stuff around. Yeah, right. Too bad we All didn't right. tell him earlier. We didn't get yeah. much snow in Chicago. <laughs> he could have shoveled some driveways. Yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna ask your permission because I have a little project coming up that I would like to use your bike in the future to uh, <laughs> for a. Uh, for a little project I'm doing in the near, in the very, very near future. I, Does it I, involve I, assless chaps? We know you love those. Uh, I don't know yet. I, maybe All without right. the chaps. It's, get, <laughs> I it's, it's getting know. warmer, man. I know. It's well, it is, it is assless chap season. So even in Chicago, it's assless chap season. So that's good. All right. So let's do this because of our time. Um, and, um, any, anything you want to tell our listeners or anything else that you can think of that you really want our listeners to know about this bike, how to get it. Um, I, I know that you said June, they can, how many, how many do you have left at the special price? A, a handful? Yeah. Two handfuls, almost exactly. So we're okay. doing, we've ordered a hundred bikes and this is secret proprietary information, but you can All tell right. everybody. Yeah, we won't, we won't. We, o- we ordered a hundred, but we've <laughs> right. communicated that we have 50 for sale at the pre-sale price. Okay. The remaining 50 will sell once they get here, ready to ship at the full price. Right. We've already sold 40. We've sold 39. Once we sell 40, we're messaging that we are only have 10 left. That could be as soon as tomorrow. Awesome. And the and we're we're just we're absolutely stunned that they're selling because we're doing almost zero digital ad spend, which is the only way that you sell anything on the internet. It's right. It's as sure as gravity. And they're selling pretty much organically Good. through the content we've created the content and we're pushing We're we're used car salesmen, these things no, pushing as hard as we can, but it's, it's going. So, I mean, I could go on forever about the product, whatever, but I'll tell you what, if anybody goes to zoos bikes on Instagram, Z O O Z bikes, um, send me a message. I'm the guy on the other end. Uh, if you have any questions, comment, whatever, uh, go there. But, Figure out for yourself. The listeners here will be able yeah. to understand what it no, is. No, they'll get it. But make sure you have a, some time put away because Chris does not like to talk, though. So he he will he's not passionate about right. this at all. Keep he's it not keep it short. About... <laughs> <laughs> I, love, I just love busting your balls, brother. All right, so I... this is going to be fun. Um, yeah. Not nomination time. So I want three people. That okay. you think, um, and, and I've been kind of waiting for this from you, brother. Okay, I know... so uh, I've, I've listened to almost every single one of your episodes, and I've been preparing for this one because uh, good. I think I think it's brilliant, and I think you should cast as wide of a net as you can. Obviously, there's it's pretty builder heavy, and frankly, I love it. Um, I really enjoyed the Nikki Smart one. Oh, he's because an awesome guy, man. I had never heard of him until your podcast never heard of him really and i was driving from indianapolis back to chicago last week when i listened to it and it's like at the end of every sentence and i was like this guy is so fucking right just his perspective on everything it's like i want to adopt him 
That's great. It probably was the other way around. I think he's a little bit older than I am, but and, that's anyway, okay. He's a great guy. Was, he, yeah, man. And and you, like I said at the beginning of this, you get to really get a nice snapshot of who this person is. It's like a barroom conversation that you get to eavesdrop in on. And, you know, we all like r- rub each other's elbows at these shows and everything. And sometimes like, yeah, you don't really get the in to meet some of these people. And of course you go to enough and get to meet everybody, but um, this way, like you get to know who some, what people are about. And I, I really like that. So uh, I want to, I want to cast a really wide net for you while I have this Thank nomination you. opportunity. Um, Christian and I wanna, Sosa. I, I'm going to, I'm going to interrupt you for one second because yeah. I think that a lot of people think it's just builders, but Right. It just so happens that I was kind of born into that, but there's yeah. such a wide scope of things. So I appreciate what you're saying, and I appreciate what you're about to say. Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. We'll see. Well, how maybe. That works out. Maybe. So, <laughs> so, um, Christian Sosa mentioned the guys at Thrive. Yeah. I'm I'm a total fanboy of what they're doing, but I'm not wasting my vote on them. Christian said, "Do it," and I'm sure you're going to hold that up. So get Thrive on there. I second that notion. Mm-hmm. Um, personally that I would like to hear from is, uh, Jeff Wright, church of choppers, probably one of my favorite builders ever, but he's, he's kind of obscure. He's doing his own thing. But if you look at his shit, if, if you have half a wit and you look at any of the stuff he's doing, there is so much going on and I've never seen so much creativity and just outside of the box thinking and motorcycling come from one source. And multidisciplinary as well, so that's who I'd like to hear of him. But um, that's so that's if that's one out of three. The two are I you, are, I, you, are you are you going to help me get in get in touch with him? I don't know. Him. Do you that's know? That's why him? I, I that, no, I don't. Okay, I follow him on Instagram. You know, I but, I've, I've heard other people say that he's just fantastic. So I, I'm gonna I'm gonna reach out again. I'll just bother people. People want to hear him. I'll, I'll get him. Yeah, you you're good at that. I'll try. I'm a star. I'm kidding. <laughs> um, so, so like personally, that's what I like to hear. But like for the benefit of of uh, the pigeonhole, I'd I'd like to cast your net as far as you can. So I'm going to cast it all the way over to India. All right, let's go India. And there are two people that I think would be ideal to start with, and maybe they'll nominate other people, and I hope they will, because it's really a fantastic place. I didn't spend too much time talking about it, about what it is, and really just my story. But this is like going to another planet, man, and the, their approach to motorcycling is legit. Okay. Um, and and they, they do with what they can with what they've got. But like, I have a friend who rode a 1970 Royal Enfield Bullet, for a quarter of a million kilometers inside of four and a half years on a 1970, 1955 design <laughs> motorcycle manufactured in 1970, had a whole life before it got to him. In less than five years, he rode a quarter of a million kilometers inside Holy India shit. only. Unbelievable. Right. And there are people that do all this type of stuff. His name is Abhijit Rao. You can, uh, you can nominate him. I'll okay. Give you the how details do, how, of how to okay. Yeah, yeah. How about you? You can. How about? Do you happen to know his Instagram right off your right off the hand? If you don't, yeah, it's okay. It's uh, it's Abhijit M Rao. So A B I, A B I, A B I, J I, J I T H T H M R A O. So it's a short one, is what you're saying. Yeah. Well, that's his first name, middle no, initial. I, I, no, I get it. I get it. I'm just busting your balls uh, again. So, no, so he, he's really one. Cool. He's an interesting dude. He was the first person to take a Royal Enfield Himalayan out of India. He flew it from New Delhi to Tajikistan, did the stands, did Mongolia, then put it on the Trans-Siberian Railroad, sent it, to, got on it with, oh, it broke his frame and swing arm in Mongolia. What? Limped it out of, limped this thing out of Mongolia put it on a bus, then on a train to Moscow, then limped it from Moscow to Berlin to have it <laughs> replacement. And then did all of Europe, all of Eastern Europe, Romania, et cetera, then through Iran and then sent it on a boat from Iran back to India. This guy's a and wild did, man. Did this on the Indian rupee, a humble earning, saved up all his stuff, 
camping, starving, riding. Awesome. That's Balls. fantastic. Yeah, no shit. I there, thought you were fucking crazy. There's another one. <laughs> yep. There's another one, uh, another rider. This guy is really interesting. Um, kind of a bigger name. His name is Veer Nakai. He's actually, he's part of the GoPro family. Like, he's, he's a legit dude. He, the, the best way, how to describe him. So he rides all types, you know, okay, this is the best way to describe him. He is the Indian Magnus Walker. Do you know who Magnus nice. Walker is? I absolutely don't. Okay. <laughs> I'm well, shaking should, my head yes should... and telling you no. <laughs> yeah, you should... no. All right. So you should. Fuck, I, you I know. I your... can name all the you guys. Get... Paul... You... I can name the guy in Paw Patrol. You want to do that? <laughs> Sorry. That's Paw Patrol. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. All right. Moving right. on. <laughs> you should get Magnus Walker on here. All right. Magnus Walker is him a on... fascinating. St- His how name is Magnus Walker. His name is Magnus Walker. All right. I'm just I'm Magnus just telling... Magnus Walker Magnus Walker is where's Waldo. But he's got dreads and a long beard and he drives Porsches and he's got a, a crazy interesting story. But he's all over the place, all around the world. If you follow him on Instagram, his stories are a mile long. And he's just like post, 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 like where is this guy? And then he just pops up places. You'll be at like hand built show or some show, and it's like you see him walk by, it's like, holy shit. That's Waldo funny. just walked by. <laughs> Very well, interesting guy. Great. Look now, him up. You... He's all over YouTube. He's he's like a he's like a legit celebrity. Anyway, Veer Nakai is like the Indian version of him. And he's just like all over the place riding different motorcycles in different countries. He was at Mama Tried last year. Really? Like international man of mystery. And he Veer just Nakai, shows up. He's all over the place, man. I don't even know what he does. He just rides motorcycles. Ducati a couple of years ago for their anniversary did this ride with the new Multistrada rode one uh, multistrada around the world divided up by like 12 or 16 people whatever it was and they all rode a segment he did the first segment from the factory in bologna to moscow i think but he went up through uh scandinavia and did all those crazy roads through the fjords and the little islands and ended up in moscow handed it over like this is the type of shit he's like where are you today and what are you riding wow I don't think anybody, I don't think I know anybody who rides more different motorcycles within one year than he does. That is and he's, cool. and, and he's well known in India. Uh, and it would, it would be a nice like planting of the pigeonhole flag in India to start. Boom. There's yes. one more. All right. Hit me. Uh, Vijay Singh is probably one of the most recognized custom motorcycle builders to get back to the custom motorcycle builders, one yeah. of the most recognized custom motorcycle builders in India. Okay. He really super sweetheart. Uh, I was at his wedding and Dre and I were at his wedding. Um, really nice guy, really humble dude and started a motorcycle shop. He has like 20 employees. Um, and wow. You know, like in India, they have, they don't have the caste system, but there is stratification. And so if you are a laborer, you work with your hands, you're kind of on the lower echelon of stuff. But he takes care of these guys so well. He takes care of their families. It's like a big family. And the outfit is called Rajputana Custom Motorcycles. The state that he's in is um, Rajasthan. And the people from Rajasthan are the Rajputs. So Rajputana custom motorcycles. Okay. And spell that, he builds spell that for me. Spell that for me and my listeners so they can look them up too. Yeah. Uh, R A J. R A J. P U T A N A. Um, you type in that part and it's, yeah. I think it's Rajput. It's Rajputana customs. I think is his Instagram handle. Okay. But That's cool. Rajputana custom to... motorcycles. And if anybody listening doesn't like that I that I slow people down to spell it, let me know because I I, I think a lot of people have listened. They go, oh shit, I gotta follow that guy. I gotta do this. So yeah, yeah, um, no, it's cool. I like you, you know, I'm time. learning about new people from your podcast. So I can only hope that new people learn about these guys. So he's he's been around for. He's a well established builder. He's done projects with Royal Enfield, with Triumph, with Harley. He built actually the very first custom Harley Davidson Street 750. 
This is that their new mid-sized motorcycle came out several years ago, but it oh, was shit. it was the first motorcycle that they built completely in India because you know they're outsourcing these days, like right. everybody else. It's part of modern economies, manufacturing. Right. But I thought it was so cool that the Indian-made motorcycle. They didn't. They could have chosen any builder they wanted in the world, but they chose at that time a relatively obscure, not so well-known Indian builder to do it, and he built a great bike and he builds great bikes but not only that he's a racer they have a racing league in india and these guys are nuts so <laughs> so while i was there i was not really big into racing today i'm a huge moto gp fanboy these guys converted so while i was producing the documentary they're like you should we're uh it's like oh you're going back to delhi we can give you a ride there we're going in like three days we're going to the racetrack uh in fact why don't you come with us? So basically okay. they kidnapped me to go race a motorcycle. And I was like, but Jay, I, I gotta be honest here. I, I've never ridden a motorcycle that way. He's like, Chris, you know how to ride a motorcycle. This will be great. And you will meet a motorcycle for the first time. So they take me to the, they take me to the racetrack, good international circuit. It's India's formula one track. This is a world-class <laughs> yeah. facility in the middle of india and they and they they gave me the the bike the boots the leathers the helmet the gloves everything and it was just show up i'm on a ktm rc 390 and right before we're about to pit out uh and i'm like well i'm about to do this i'm about to do this i'm about to do this he goes up he goes okay a couple things um toes on the pegs and uh when you're leaning over when you're at the maximum when you think you're leaning over you can go an extra 12 inches. Oh and God. if you feel like you're gonna fall over, open the throttle. It's a Formula One track. You have so much room, you're not gonna run wide. <laughs> and, and, then, and then he said, oh, and if you don't dump it, I'll be very, I'll be very unhappy with you. <laughs> so I did. I, 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 I low-sided at turn three, which is like a 160-degree hairpin, which everybody crashes there the first time. And basically is too much lean, not enough speed. So I was trying to follow the instructions, but I wasn't going fast enough. <laughs> right. When you think and, you're going to uh, fall, go faster. That's kind of a weird right. thing to think about. And yeah. so ever since then, I'm like, I got to get back on a racetrack. I got to get back on a racetrack. And I, I actually built, awesome, I though, built a track bike for myself since then. That's a whole nother story. Wow. Um, and uh, wow. yeah, so those guys, him and his best friend um, are in the national race series there. His best friend, Deepu Dilip Lalwani. Deepu is the uh, the official Ducati rider. He's riding a Ducati V4R. This is what they're riding in World Superbike Racing. And this is what I'm saying. Like, these guys are legit. Some people might overlook them. Like, oh, yeah, it's like they've got their little thing going. Race these motherfuckers. They will smoke you. So, <laughs> India. Put them on the map, Dave. I'm going to try to put them on the map. Rao, Vijay Singh. You know what? And I love it. So thank you. Thank you for opening my horizons. I, I don't think we're very big in India. I think we only have like 11 listeners there right now. So we're, we're going to open what, this shit up. Be careful what you ask for. How many followers do you have right now? Uh, followers on Instagram? Instagram or listeners on... In, in, see, Instagram. Instagram. Uh, Instagram's hard because I think we're at almost well, 700 like, right now. Like I said about my followers, 95% of them are Indian because of my film I made. You get these three guys on your podcast, you're going to go Boom. from 700 to like 750. I'm kidding. <laughs> no, no. You're hilarious. Do, man. do it, man. Don't, don't, pay, don't pay these like Instagram whores to, you want followers? No, just no. go to India. You know what, I, and I'm, I'm going to touch on something here right now because uh, I don't know if anybody's listened this far in the podcast, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm making the stand right now, okay? So I want to let anybody that's listening to our podcast right now, if you follow me on Instagram, I'm following you back because I am so sick, and I don't care who the fuck I offend by this. I am so fucking sick of people that have 20 million followers and they follow like 40 or, or, or 300 seriously this is a fucking community get your shit together if people are interested in what you do and they support you support them fucking back 
Yeah. And I'm sure that I'm, I'm sure that. the people have a thousand fucking arguments for that. But if you follow me on Instagram, I'm following you fucking back because if you're interested in what I got to do, I want to know what you're doing. And we're we're I guess building that means community. I got to follow you now. Yeah, now you got to follow me. <laughs> but it, but seriously, I'm it's kidding, man. I know, but it's something that's been really bothering me, and I and I want to. Yeah. If I have one goal, I'm going to change that. I'm going to make sure that these guys that have seven thousand followers and they follow one hundred, follow your 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 friends. I'm not. They're not fans. Yeah. They're not whatever. But they let's let's make this more of a community. So everybody get well, on. Well, I love what you're doing with this man because you are Thank building you. this community, whether you know it or not. Just because you're creating this resource, this it's a database basically of people's own histories and perspectives and information that is far more rich and has far more depth than you can find just on Instagram. And sure, it's a commitment to listen to me blather on for an hour and something sure. minutes right now, but do it while you're stuck in traffic, you know? Right, exactly. And, and, and then go and buy an e-bike. Right. While, you're buying, while you're ordering your e-bike, put the, put the pigeonhole on. All right, right. brother, we're, gonna, we're wrapping this up. So Chris is on yeah, I know I said your name wrong in the beginning. I'm sorry. I, I always it's was, like Zeus, man. Say it how you want. I don't care. Yeah, Zoner. So Chris Smith, thank you so much for being on the show. And uh, thank, everybody thanks, follow Dave <laughs> Hey, Dave Grohl. I like him. <laughs> Uh, but yeah. follow, follow Chris. Check out the zoos. You know what? If you're not interested, share with your friends because my 14 year old or 15 year old boy is gonna. They're all gonna be riding them around. So and not too long. Me, my fat ass. And on in a 10 bike. years, they're gonna be riding Harleys and Ducatis and Hondas and whatnot. So exactly. you know, it's all part of the circle of life. Right. Let's get them going. So. Yep. Hey, thanks, brother, for all your time. I appreciate it, and we'll be talking very soon, brother. Yeah, man. Take care. Take care, man.